Well, today's speaker, I think, uh, needs no introduction. And I think the number of people who are looking to, to get involved in this, in this session shows that. Um, Andy Weissman's a partner, a managing partner at Union Square Ventures. Um, really one of the most revered and successful VCs in the world, having backed you know, companies like Twitter, Stripe, Coinbase, Kickstarter, Skillshare, Samba. I could go on and on and on. We're going to talk about that later on. Um, and I guess at Airtree, uh, my co-founder, Daniel Petrie, and I have, have been big fans of what USV have done over the years. And we've learned a lot about investing and about keeping the size of funds manageable, about flat management structures, network effects. Um, been fortunate enough to co-invest with USD. But also, I guess Andy, um, Andy's been very patient and kind and hosted me when I'm in New York and happy to, happy to sit there patiently and while I pepper him with questions about how to build a VC firm, how to invest. Uh, so I, I was really thrilled when he, uh, when he said yes. And I'm, if it's not obvious, I'm a bit of a fanboy. Um, so, so thank you, Andy, Andy um, and welcome, welcome to our, our community in Australia, New Zealand. Thanks. It's fun, fun to be here. It's fun to see 16 pages of faces. That's awesome. That's superb. Uh, Andy, I guess, I guess uh, uh, why don't I start with you quickly, just talk about you and, and, and your journey. Um, you know, I think you started in the mid-90s in the internet space. We could both kind of share experience around that sort of first incarnation. But so your journey from there into the VC world. Yeah, so I started um, in the mid-1990s I, I, uh, as a very young uh, entry-level professional or semi-entry-level professional. I started to work at AOL. Um, this was around 1996 or 1995, and I kind of, yeah, some. I like to say I learned almost everything I ever, I, every, I learned everything that was probably most relevant to me during that four-year period. By that, I mean um, AOL was also a very flat management structure, and AOL's management philosophy was to hire kind of smart people with no experience, because who knew how to run an internet business in 1996 anyway? Um, and from there... Uh, I got into venture and started a venture capital fund with a bunch of people uh, that was, uh, I would say it was semi uh, successful, but not uh, totally successful. Um, and then I went back to operating and I started a company called Betaworks, which was a bit of a holding company structure. Uh, we did two, we did two things off of one balance sheet. We invested in companies um, and then we also built companies and then spun them out all from, all from one entity. Um, and that was from about 2005 or so to about 2010, 2011. Uh, and then I went and joined USB as the fourth or maybe fifth partner, I think around 2011, maybe the beginning of 2012. Um, and I've been there since and now I'm, a, uh, I guess, what we call a managing partner. I'm not sure what responsibilities that have, except it probably means I'm responsible for the taxes of the firm, even though I don't do the house tax. <laughs> And, and as we'll talk about later on, you, you, you get involved in office moves and placements and team structure and all those stuff. It's really not spoken about much in venture, the venture world. So yeah. It's been tremendous. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, lot, I mean, the, the, beta, um, the beta works is obviously, it was a, was a really interesting and pioneering kind of model, I guess. Uh, uh, what, 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 what learnings and what, what helped, you know, what, what helped you from that world into your venture career? I think that the, um, I think there were probably primarily two or three things. One is um, the notion that at some level, a, there, there's a timing aspect to a startup, which does not mean that when you start a company, you have to get the timing exactly right. But when you start a company, you have a vision of the future. At, at some level, you're trying to convince a lot of people, investors, employees, partners to come along for that vision. And so there's a timing aspect to it that it's, it has to line up at some point. And at Betaworks, we had a hypothesis, and that hypothesis was this early notion of social media was not a niche, but actually was going to transform every industry. And we were betting on that, and we built businesses, invested businesses around that. And when you get, when you get that timing part right, there's a lot of other mistakes um, that can get glazed over. Um, and, um, and so that was one big one. The second um, thing that I think is, was probably maybe even more important for me was this notion of, of, uh, of empathizing, you know, the journey of, of the entrepreneur, the journey of the startup and having empathy or understanding that. By that, I mean, you know, we, over time, we probably raised somewhere in like 40 or $50 million into Baidworks and every single fundraise we had was incredibly difficult for two reasons. One is we were trying to convince people that social media mattered and it's, and it seems anachronistic now, but like, 
talking to people about feeds and news feeds and followers and following. There's a lot of time you had to convince people around that. Um, and, um, and so every fundraise was very, and then we had an odd structure. So every fundraise was incredibly difficult. And there were, there were you know, 19 no's for every one yes we got. Um, and the, that process was opaque to me before I had done it. And it still is very vivid right now. I said this to someone earlier today. I remember every single no. I remember the moment. I remember who. Some of those people are my friends. In fact, some of them are my partners right now, which we can talk about. But I remember all those moments and the, the, intense, um, uh, the intense feeling of ego when you're trying to convince someone to do something with you or give you money and not being able to convince them while it's part of the process is really intense. And I think that... I, uh, I just learned a lot from that side of the table. And I think it probably gives me a little, some measure, additional measure of empathy as an investor, um, whether that's in companies we invest or companies that we don't invest in. One of the things at USB, we are really, we like, you know, we talk a lot about and to ensure that we live up to this when there's something that isn't right for us that we articulate specifically why we sp articulate that incredibly quickly. We do it with honesty um, and as much as, you know, and, and be very clear. And I think a lot of that for me at least comes from, I was on the other side of the table and I heard all the reasons that I, that made sense or didn't make sense. I, I was in a lot of VC meetings where you just know someone's not listening. That's okay. It's not a problem. But like when you go through it, I don't know, I'd never, I'd never forget those moments. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and the funny thing about it is that, um, and then the third thing I think, which is maybe the most important now that I think about it, is that we were a New York company. And so we wanted the best firm in New York to invest in us. And that was Union Square Ventures. So we pitched USV like every quarter for years we pitched them to try and we could never we could never get them to invest in our company um but we became very close business partners with them and then ultimately i ended up joining the firm which there that, that's there's something about longevity of relationships even when they start with a rejection and to me it actually says something a lot about the people at usv even though i couldn't convince them to allow you know to give me money um Somehow we ended up in a relationship where I was part of the firm as a general partner. And I think that says a lot about the nature of people and the nature of relationships in this business. Um, that's probably the most important thing of all. Yeah, yeah great. So, and super interesting to hear your, your points around uh, empathy. I think we, 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 we talk a lot about that and the empath empathizing. I'll come back to the pitch area, but empathizing with the, just the founder journey of like, hiring people and not getting hires right and maybe letting teams go and uh, your, your, your point about sort of getting the disappointment or knocking rounds away or rounds having delayed and losing your fingernails as, you, as your cash flow is burning out. Uh, I think one of the, <clears throat> the humbling experiences we have now, I guess you, you'd have, you'd have to say, well, is, is, is doing pitches with LPs. Um, you know, we have to do the same thing. Now, I guess, you know, you guys would, I would imagine that's a fairly easy journey for you. Um, we're, we're fortunate that, you know, it, it, it's not, too difficult, but I don't take that for granted. But you can have meetings, which are just terrible meetings. They just they're not interested Absolutely. in meetings, and there's just no, and you walk away just feeling ugh. And so I think yeah. we all should go to that meeting as VCs and show that respect and humility and empathy you talked about. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I I, I there was when we did, a, I think it was a Series B financing. We were we had no money left in the bank, and the round was closing, but it got delayed. Um, and I there's a moment I remember it was about 11:30 p.m. And I called my co-founder and I was like, I hope, is this going to close? And he's like, yeah, yeah, it's, everything's, you know, what's the issue? And I'm like, I'm looking at the bank account, we're zero. I'm now I'm not, I'm not paying bills. Hmm. Um, and I remember being one of the most intenseful, stressful moments. And then we got the fundraising done. But, um, but you know, I've lived through that and I can kind of, I get, I kind of get a little bit of that. I understand a little bit of like sweating a payroll yeah. and what that, what that means. I never want to do that again. I never will do that again. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but I saw it, I felt it. So close the deal and wire the money, right? If you're on the, on the outside. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, exactly. Just switching, switching, I guess, tax into your investment approach and, you know, particularly the thematics. And then I guess interested in how the founders on this call might use that to kind of inform how they should think, how they might think about building a, a business. So maybe the evolution from your thematics, you know, one, two, three, and then most important, I guess your last one around trusted brands. It'd be interesting to hear your, you describe that. 
Yeah, I think like the U, the USV approach is, is somewhat, um, I might characterize it as somewhat peculiar, meaning we have a, we have kind of a certain way of doing things that, that I think works for this group of people that, that may, some of which may be applicable, a lot of it may not be applicable, but it all starts from the notion that we think that there's, um, you have, when you have a worldwide uh, network of computers that are connected and therefore, and people that are holding those computers or interacting with those computers, um, that that kind of is like a seismic shift. Um, and therefore, everything that came after the invention of the internet, and I'm generalizing, it can be transformational in new ways. And, our, and we've been investing against that for 15 years. And every four or five years, we just describe it a different way. Um, but it's the same core thought that we had, uh, which is what's native about this technology, um, this technology stack we call the internet. And, and for the first uh, five years, we called it large networks, which is of engaged users, which is like, if you have, you know, again, if you have the worldwide network, you could actually build applications where you have everyone in the world on them, um, or a large portion of the world, and that's Twitter and Tumblr and things like that. Um, and then as we saw the maturity of that, um, we looked at uh, uh, this notion that instead of large networks uh, of engaged users that, that included maybe kind of everyone, you could have kind of vertical networks around a certain topic or a certain subject matter area that were large within that vertical, um, and that led us uh, and that led us actually to things like education and digital healthcare and probably financial services um, and actually probably uh, cryptocurrencies as yeah. well. Um, and then the third articulation of it, and again, kind of the same idea was once you have a kind of one and two, what's, what's changed now? And we had this notion that the thing that was changed is a, a new notion of trust mm. um, that, that may be meaning different, that could mean different things or new things. And in fact, maybe trust could be as important uh, uh, overall as network effects. Uh, and, and we wanted to look for companies that were establishing a trusted relationship in a way that expanded or broadened access to a few major areas. One, first one being knowledge, the second one being capital, and the third one being well, well-being. Right. Um, and we use those as kind of, uh, and, and those articulations are important to us because I think for a couple of reasons. One is the words are very dynamic and they're meant to have be changed. You know, what does trust mean? I'm not sure I could tell you, but it's a pretty interesting conversation. What is a brand? What does broadening access mean? They're, the words are meant to be um, excessively uh, uh, dynamic and conversational, um, and um, and we can and we learn by publishing them, and we learn by what people telling us they think that means. Um, so it's a construct that allows for an interesting conversation. Um, it's also a construct. For that allows us to very rapidly determine what things are not are not relevant to us as a group of people and an investment firm, or, or we might not have experience on. So it's a way of being able to say to the market, we don't do this, so it's not worth your time having a conversation with us, and we'll try not to waste your time as well. So it has both kind of positive and negative implications to the market that we think works for entrepreneurs because they know what we stand for and it works for us. We know what we're looking for, but we know also things that we just couldn't do or, or wouldn't or wouldn't be good at doing. I, I, I'd like to sort of just d dive in a bit deeper in this idea of brand and trust. And you say they're kind of fairly malle malleable terms, but I think at least I guess what we see, I guess, um, you know, I, I guess I'm part of a lot of our consumer investments, this idea of brand, what is a brand? I think it's, you know, some people go straight to the logo, which is clearly not about the adult marketing spend, but, I, can you maybe parse out okay, what you learned around sort of what could brand mean for a founder who's got a product, community, an experience, and, and, and they're the th I guess they're the levers that they're playing with, and it's not as marketing spend or logos or any other, other stuff. Yeah. No, and so I, the, what I like about this question is that um, the um, so in the uh, uh, in the wording. Uh, you'll you'll notice we call them trusted brands. We did not break those words apart. They are they are joined, um, meaning that there's some attribute of what you're doing that engenders trust between a user and you, or trust between two different machines. Um, and in fact, it has nothing. So a lot of times we'll have conversations with companies we invested in about what's the what what's the name of the company? How should they choose the name? And our answer typically is it doesn't really matter. It's what you imbue with that name and what you do with that name. So I'll give you two examples um, that probably articulate one is a USB thing and one is a non USB thing that I think represent a, what are the some of the attributes. And so we invest um, um, about five or six years ago, we started investing pretty um, significantly in digital health. 
And one of the thoughts we had was, could you use technology actually to establish a trusted relationship in an area where people have explicitly, by most of the research that we saw, don't have trust anymore in medicine or, or medical professionals. And, uh, and so we didn't know what that meant, except that that was a, that was a fact. Uh, and then as we thought about it more, we thought the lack of trust was that in people's interaction with the medical world, uh, you lose control of time and you lose control of space. By that, I mean, you're on someone else's time. You're often waiting um, uh, for a long period of time to actually see the physician. You're waiting for a long period of time to get your results back. Um, you're probably stressed because you want to get back to work or your family. Um, so you've lost control of time uh, and then you've lost control um, um, of, of location, of geography. You're not you're not in your office, you're not in your home, you're somewhere else. Hopefully it's close to those places, but oftentimes it can't be. And so we had this notion that in, in digital healthcare, if you could flip the control model and give control over time and space back to people, you could establish trust around a service. And we started investing in um, healthcare that was delivered asynchronously over text. Um, and the asynchronous part matters because now you're in control of time. You can respond when you need to. It's asynchronous and space actually on your, on your, you're in control of space because using your phone, you can respond to what you want. To that, that was a notion of trust. And we invested in a couple of companies whose NPS scores were off the charts, even though they're, in, even though they were not, we believe as investors in those companies, they were immature and they weren't yet delivering service that we believed warranted those high scores but the scores were off the charts because you were actually giving control back to people. And so to, thus that's a notion of trust. And then you can imbue a brand, a name of a service with those attributes. And so that's one in the US portfolio. I'll give you another one um, that, uh, that we look at kind of for inspiration, which is actually Netflix. Um, and the trust that comes from Netflix, we believe, or I believe comes from a couple different attributes. One is you pay one price and you get everything. So there's no cognitive stress around, is this going to cost me $5 US? Is this going to cost me $2? I just pay my $9.99 US dollars and I get everything. Um, but, but then there's other these kind of small, almost throwaway UX elements that lead to that skip intro. So on Netflix, if you hit this button, you won't have to watch the introduction to a program. Again, you're shifting control back to someone. Um, the idea that you, if you like a show, you can watch all the episodes at once. In a way, it kind of seems almost kind of silly, but think about like the cognitive overload in someone. I don't have to wait a week. I can just consume it now if I want to. And we believe that's a trusted relationship. And typically when you have trust, um, you have engagement and retention that goes along with it. So those, are, you know, trust is, in other words, it's not something that you say, it's something that you kind of imbue, you almost in user experience um, and how someone partakes in what you do. And then that leads to that kind of trustful thing. Consistency is a, we think is a, actually a huge element of trust. If you deliver something consistent, people, people will trust you. Interesting. And I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure I, 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 if we had time, I'd love to go through that same framework into financial services. Cause I know you've done in FinTech as well. Totally. You speak yep. as in this community from the you know, banks and lending businesses that we've backed. And I think there's parallels there around sort of consistency your message you know on open and transparent a ux experience it feels like they call you by the first name it's just, it's just a simple little ux experience at all sort of hand in hand control totally. over to the customer and then hopefully in, in turn generate negative nps's into positive trusted brand. absolutely yeah. totally completely um just i guess switching i guess back out uh back up a little bit in terms of um i guess the climate we're in now it's, you know, it's obviously kind of very crazy times we're in, particularly in the US. Um, um, and I think you know, one of the beneficiaries of that is we get people like you on Zooms like this. So we're very grateful in some ways, but obviously there's a lot of, a lot of hard <laughs> and a lot of downside on the other side. But I guess what's for you, what, 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 what are these sort of, what are these changing times done to your thesis? Have you seen any particular trends accelerate or decelerate as a result of the last you know, three, three or five months? Well, one of the one of the nice things about having a thesis is um, for us is we believe that it absolves us from having to be reactionary to the markets. In other words, if you believe your thesis, you know, you can now, now you've got five or 10 years to figure out if your thesis was right. So for my partner, Fred, and I were talking about a week ago, um, we we started investing pretty heavily in online learning and online education about seven years ago. And it's probably 
Oh, well, I'll bet it's about 15 to 20% of our portfolios, maybe the biggest category. And Fred and I were talking, we're saying, well, it's kind of, isn't it kind of nice, you know, that the world has now caught up, you know, to something that, that we saw seven years ago. And, and, um, and we kind of took like a moment of like, well, that's kind of the nice thing about a thesis is you hope eventually, you know, you're right. Um, and the world catches up to you um, and it gets accelerated and all those early investments you've made or bets you've made start paying off. Um, and then you're kind of competitive the spirit gets in and you're like, oh, well, now we got to pay a higher price. Now we're not the only ones investing in education. We got to work a little harder. But that's the nice thing about the thesis. Like, the, you know, like education and healthcare were two, digital health were two really big areas six or seven years ago. And those have, you know, those markets, as you all have seen, have just excelled, you know, you've got 10 years of future state that accelerated into a six month period it's kind of a whirlwind it's hard to hold if you know it feels good like oh we were right about that um but it's a bit of a whirlwind for every one of those there are other parts of the thesis that did not play out you know so it's not like all those all those areas we were right about there are a lot we were wrong about you just you know you kind of part of the nature of venture businesses we get to move on from those and so um and so but that's part of what's happened is is that kind of you know the notion of online learning in, in everyone, you know, we have this thing like, you know, think that there's this word called telehealth, which is, is very misused, but, um, but we'd seen some research on Google that in the United States, that word has popular meaning right now. And in January, it did not have popular meaning. You know, the average person has a notion of what that means, which is incredibly important for trying out a new service. And just six months ago, they, that word was you know, maybe, maybe you, you and I or people on this call knew about that. So, um, so it's been kind of, you know, for, for those things, it's been uh, really interesting. I could give you, you know, three or four of, of, of companies in our portfolio who, who, uh, who had maybe the, the best month in their history in February and in March, they zero, zero business, you know? So there's, there's two sides to it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if you just, on that point, if you, if you sort of went across your portfolio, I guess, you know, I guess our experience was in that sort of February time was the world's going to end, you know, it was scenario planning. Yeah. Okay. It's cutting costs and some zero revenue is going to zero buying to in our case, December 21. And, and, and you're right. And I guess in a handful of cases, it's, it's not pretty. And that's, that's I mean, most, most of the companies have time by the way, but it's definitely some tough times, but in, in the majority, I would say companies are either as good as their top scenario or in some cases better than they were before COVID. Yeah, I don't want to make light of that because that's, I mean, that was a huge range there and there's obviously the company's doing tough, but what, what's, what's been your experience across the portfolio? So one, you know, I think it's precisely the same. It's almost like a barbell, right? You know, there are, there are companies that were doing well that are doing, you know, by, by June had blown through their two, 2020 projections, you know, so they got, you know, you know, there's that. Um, and then there's companies that were doing well, whose business maybe went to almost zero. You know, so it's like kind of like that barbell, you know, the, the, the ones that were working worked better than ever. And the ones, uh, and then there were some that weren't working at all. And then there's this stuff in the middle, but this is why I think like one of the, uh, one of the, uh, uh, one of the things I think I've learned in the past 10 years is, is there are two sides to venture. There's like what it looks like from the outside and then what actually what it is in the inside. Right. So what it looks like from the outside is like people like you and I, Craig are brilliant in our ability to pick the next great company. <laughs> and it's a, and it's a sign of our intellect and our foresight. Uh, yeah. Right. And then here's, and then the reality is actually what we do is we construct portfolios. Mm. Um, each one of our funds has 20 to 25 companies. Maybe yours has the same amount and we construct a portfolio of 25 companies and, and that portfolio in itself is diversified among sector. It may be a little diversified among stage. It may be diversified in geography. And so therefore it's actually, it's actually designed to be resilient yeah. um, in a way that it works really well. And it's designed actually to withstand external shocks, you mm -hmm. know, um, and then a couple of those may work out and then we look brilliant, but really what we did is we constructed a portfolio um, and that portfolio approach is I think this kind of secret to why venture works. It's not, it's not a, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It, it enables you and I, you know, yeah. to invest millions of dollars in companies that, you know, that are starting from scratch. So it's a wonderful, I call venture like the perfect system, but I don't know if it's really about picking, it's about constructing that portfolio. So if you do that construction, you know, cause some of them are going to work out some of them are not going to work out. And maybe this year, those, those bars got accelerated, but I think the system generally worked. 
Got it, got it. And do you, just on the portfolio, do you, how, how do you go about that in real life? I mean, do you look at investments and do you literally sort of create that geographical or stage or type of business yeah. portfolio or does it just sort of happen through serendipity? No, no, we, 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 this is, you know, we're, we talk about it all the time. We analyze it all the time. So for example, we, uh, there was a company that we are talking to now in our latest fund, so we raised a new fund um, um, actually uh, last year, about a year from now. Um, and we realized in looking at that fund that we had no digital health companies in that fund. So we kind of, we, we decided we kind of want, if we could, we want to add one to that. You know, we want to add a digital. So we're actually analyzing that way. We may look at stage, you know, we may say, hey, we just did four investments under $2 million, that's earlier than we usually go. Maybe we should balance it out with something a little later. Now we don't go late, like you were early stage investors, but, but we think about it all the time, balancing the check size, the, the, um, um, the sector, um, the geography, the less, maybe less important, you know, things like that. So we're analyzed. So we think we're constructing a puzzle of 20 to 25 companies and we want that puzzle to be a really good kind of re diversified reflection of something. And right. so we're always, we're all, we talk about it every, every week. Okay. Interesting. It's uh, some, some learning for all of us in the, on the investment side. Um, I guess flipping back to some of the iconic companies that you guys have been involved in, and you've got a long, long list there, you know, Etsy, Tumblr, Sportsquare, Kickstarter, you know, I guess I'm sure there are founders on this call who are interested in sort of some of the learnings that they could take, from how to build these iconic businesses, how to build a culture, a trusted brand we talked about before. Could you, maybe you could call out a few you've, you've been involved with and, and maybe share some insights that you've seen over the years. Um, so here's, here's the interesting, um, uh, maybe, uh, maybe the maddening paradox of venture, right? Is that every successful startup is an exception to some rule, right? Which means then that our job is to pattern match exceptions. Yeah. Right. And so how do you, how do you possibly do that? And so I found that um, there was almost no way to do it. And so I, re I've relied on, and I think we rely on a couple of things. One is, um, one is something called like motivation, which is not like um, um, we have found that our ability to evaluate, we're not good evaluators of people. And so obviously people matter, but we probably wait our ability to evaluate people maybe differently than other firms. We're just, maybe we're not as good at it, um, uh, which is not to say it doesn't matter. So instead, one of the things I try and think about it is what's the, what's the motivation mm -hmm. of the person in doing this? And there can be lots of motivations. There's a company um, that we invested in that's gonna, that will probably do over a hundred million in, re in recurring revenue next year. And the motivation, of the, the founder had a successful exit um, mm -hmm. from his last company um, before he raised the second round of financing. Um, and the, and his, so his motivation I found was not financial per se. His motivation was he didn't get a chance to prove to the world that he could be a CEO over a long period of time. And that was incredibly important to him. He believed that the world thought the first company which he sold to Microsoft was a fluke. And what was driving him was to prove to the world it was. And I thought that's kind of an interesting archetype of someone's motivation and, and happened to be thus far pretty, pretty accurate about that, you know? And so, so that's one of the things is like, what's the personal motivation? It could be like someone who's trying to solve a certain problem, but it could be a totally new problem or, or, or something else. And so can you kind of get at a core truth that a, a core insight that is going to lead someone to actually do what is a fairly unnatural act, which is trying to start something from scratch and convince the world that you're right, you know? And so that, that's kind of, that's kind of one of the, that's one of the things. Um, the other, um, um, the other one is, um, and this kind of feels like a cliche, but it's really true. There's just this notion of um, your, your, um, how do you respond well to telling you no a lot or telling you you're wrong, you know? And that's something, you know, when, when people seem to be resilient of that, the chances of success seem to be more, which doesn't mean that that doesn't affect them, but how that, uh, how that works with them. Um, and then the third thing I think is this notion of, um, this notion of luck, which I don't actually believe that's, that luck is random. I think, it, in fact, I think it actually takes a lot of skill to be to be lucky, meaning a lot of placing yourself in enough 
situations where when, when your timing is right or that deal happens, you can take advantage of that. And I think that's kind of like a flexibility of thinking and not, um, not being doctrinaire, maybe understanding that, um, that this process is one of uncertainty and over time driving to certainty, but it takes a long time to get to certainty. And so you have to be kind of comfortable being uncomfortable so that when those things happen, your organization or you as a person are not brittle enough to allow it, uh, allow it to happen. Um, and um, so those are the, those are the, those are kind of general, but those are the things that I kind of see a yeah. lot. And then for every one of those I see, I can give you an example of something that's the opposite and it worked also. So I get it. I, I, get, I guess that as I asked that question, I, you know, I, I, I did ask it for, for good intent, but there's a massive survival bias, bias and all these things, right? So I think that the one success is probably not the, the thing that's most useful for founders. But I think that just the things you said that resonated were, I mean, the why, I think we spent a lot of time on the, on the why, which I think is a motivational point you, you talked about. And, um, you know, I think, I mean, 15 years ago, most of our founders were terrible pitches. Now they're great pitches and they talk to pitch the why. And then you can see what's the real why and what's the, what's the sort of backside why. I think there's a sort of whole point around that. Yeah. But you raised an interesting point, which you touched on before around timing. And the timing of investor, and you, I think you mentioned it in your, in your Betaworks experience. And I think at least I, I would say one of the things that we as a venture community in, in Australia, we're, you know, we're good at talking about large markets and ambition and stuff. People say that, but I think we're less good at understanding the why now. And I think that's part of the flexibility of luck thing you're talking about. The, totally. Uh, how, how would you think about, how should a founder think about the why now, the, the timing aspect of their business? I think that um, um, the, in my experience, um, it's about being able to describe um, a complex set of, it's not for one thing, it's, a, it's usually a set of variables, mm. you know, that are leading to a potential, mm. uh, nothing that exists. In other words, <clears throat> I like to say that um, as, ve as venture investors, and I think this applies to founders too, um, our, our job is actually not to predict the future. Um, our job is actually have a couple different views of what the future could look like, you know, if then statements, you know, and I think it's a series of if, if this happens and then it leads to that, then this is a possibility, mm. you know, and that's the, you know, and describing that there's, you know, that the world, there's something happening in the world um, that um, uh, that's leading to the odds of that if statement being true, you know, from like 49 to 51% you know, and the, and, the, and the implications of the then that comes from it. So I think it's that because you can never get precise about, uh, about these things. Um, Twitter was <clears throat> a company that USB invested in, we invested in at Betaworks, uh, and then I sold two companies to Twitter. I don't think you could have explained um, to <clears throat> what you couldn't have predicted was, was mobile devices and the power of mobile devices, which obviously kind of changed the trajectory of that. Um, but what you could have described, what you could have described um, was that, um, uh, that text messaging was happening a lot. So this idea of short messages was kind of beginning to be in the culture and people like that. Um, and then if you could create, and the technology was advanced enough that you could create a real time feed of those messages, then that could be interesting. There's no way what you couldn't have come up with and said, well, in 10 years, this is gonna be the world's information source. No, because that's not what it's used for. But they were like, you know, but I think the notion was, well, people are sending you short messages. So that's kind of a really interesting, there's really interesting payload on doing that. And maybe, maybe instead of sending it to one person, you could send it to the world, mm. right? Um, and then those other things, when they went, you know, when the iPhone and mobile, you know, only accelerated that. So, mm. um, so I think of it as like if then statements versus this is, we know this is what the future is going to look like. So we're building towards that. Because right. you never have, you never have precision. No, no. Uh, I think yeah. it's also this idea of you have some, maybe it's your riff landing, you have the other optionality. You, you, you can, you can survive and, and, and do well, totally. you know, in an okay environment, you can do really well if something happens, which is your if, if land statement, I think, yeah. Yeah. That sort of goes to the sort of, I think you guys have built on top of a lot of the work that Carlotta Paris has done around this installment phase, deployment phase, which I think is a higher level by now issue. Totally. Um, totally. I think, you know, I think, you know, with the words in your mouth, it feels like you're, you're more anchored around the deployment phase where you understand the platform on which you're building. Um, but I guess that's, 
that you know of itself has some timing aspects about how like you want to be on that sort of deployment phase. I mean, absolutely. Like you know, so so core underlying of the USB thesis is that we that we were in the deployment or the application phase of the internet, mm -hmm. and therefore the things that are going to get built because it exists were going to be you know the next wave of innovation or transformation. Mm -hmm. um, if we were wrong about that, you would not be having me speak here right now. You would just be like another firm, you know, that kind of missed it, you know, but we happen to be, we happen to get close to being right about that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why therefore, and so our, so that was like the first insight. The second insight um, was we were heading towards a mature market. And when you head towards a mature market, it verticalizes a bit. And some people could like look at the network and say, I'm going to transform education. I'm going to transform healthcare. And then the third insight was now that all that happened, um, um, we're, there was a there was a notion that there was a loss of trust um, in this overflow, and therefore, if you could rebuild trust through trusted brands, then that could be defensible. And so that's how it, that's how it has evolved. But the first idea was we're in the we're in the deployment phase or the application phase, mm -hmm. um, which we just you know we got right. Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, and you've got right consistently. So um, that's uh, that's uh, I guess you say while we're sitting here um, listening listening to you. Um, can we switch which uh, switch uh, tax into the sort of globalization? I think we were chatting before we jump on this call about how strange this world is, and again, not there's a lot of people you know doing it tough out there, but yeah, you know, it's it's allowing conversations like this. And I think the um, just to really maybe share some of our experience, there was a world when 15 years ago when we were investing, you could scrape together a, a round and a VC round in Australia. Yeah, you know, we were doing it then. You, you traipse across a Sand Hill Road usually and you'd maybe get a term sheet and then they'd force you to move your engineering team to Valley and then you'd pay double the price and then people would leave after 18 months. And, and there were some great business built that way. Don't get me wrong, but it was a tough road, you know. And wind the clock forward to today, you've got companies like Canva, which is you know, three or four kilometers from where I am right now. You've got a cloud guru in Melbourne with hundreds of engineers that are as good, if not better. They stick around, they're loyal. It's a, we view it as a competitive advantage, you know. And, so that's not the, at the sort of operating stage, and I think you got you you've been quite vocal in this. Like, where do you where's your sort of sphere of investment interests? Can you maybe talk us through that and how that's maybe that's changing? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's an ongoing conversation that I think you know we're. Um, what we're grappling with in some ways, it's at, at like the 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 USB um, at its core was a set of constraints um, that we believe allowed us to make decisions that generally speaking were more right than more wrong. And that constraint, like fund size was a constraint, um, equal partnership was another constraint, the thesis was another constraint, and then geography was a constraint, meaning we wanted to be an intimate firm with very active relationships with our companies, so therefore um, uh, what we would like to say is we will go as far east as Berlin and as far west as as Los Angeles, meaning cities that we could get to in a day and still be fresh and active the next day. And so there was a real geographical constraint. So, um, so what's kind of, you know, interesting now, I was telling you this story, another investor that I've worked with uh, called me up or emailed me about a week ago and said, there's a really interesting company in India. Do you want to look at it? And so my reaction is, no, we don't do that. You know, we don't, that's not what we do. And I was thinking, well, what, well what's the difference? You know, what's the difference right now? And then has that resulted in some kind of secular shift? And so my gut tells me the answer to that is yes, mm -hmm. across the board. I just don't know how it's going to play out over time. Um, and then, um, um, and so that's kind of like, that's the conversation we're having, you know, why, why, does, it, why does it matter? Uh, not only where the team is located, but what does the location even matter right now? You know, we've got a company that we did a seed investment in in January and March, the, the team of five spread out. They're all over the United States and they had to reinvent their processes to deliver the output. They make, they make content to deliver content in a remote fashion. And now we think that's a competitive advantage they have and they shouldn't go back to the same place. So I'd like to think of it like, you know, for, and I imagine that probably like you at some level, our firm is reevaluating what that possibly means. And so that's kind of, but like one bucket. And I think that's huge um, and hugely beneficial to entrepreneurs, hugely and hugely beneficial to investors. And then the second thing is I like to think of, and this is not a knock on investors. I think venture investors at some level, because we're dealing with so much uncertainty 
we hang on to certainty where we can get it, right? And so, and so what's certainty? Canva, right? That you can build a transformational, you know, industry changing business in Australia. Mm-hmm. It's not a question anymore. Mm-hmm. Done. Yeah. We're past that, you know? And I think investors are like, okay, got that analogy out of the way. Let me find the next one, mm-hmm. you know? And, may, and, and I can't go there now anyway. And what does going there mean? We'll all figure that out. But I, I think that it, there's, there's a really exciting potential where, this, where there's an aspect of this world, the funding environment or ecosystem that really is truly global. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think for some firms like us, it'll take us a little while to figure it out, but I don't think it's gonna take us years. I think it's gonna happen. I think it's gonna happen this year. I think we're gonna be forced to kind of confront that. And I think, uh, I don't know, it's kind of exciting in a way. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I, I'd be interested to see if you're seeing that play out on the, uh, on the investment side. And I think just to like uh, share our recent experience, you know, I think again, when we founded Airtree Ventures in 2014, it was typically, you know, we did a CDA, maybe you talk to people, you know, you at the CDA, but you know, typically it'd be people in the B's and C's coming in and taking it when it got big and they were ready for a, a large US expansion partner. But, yeah. but of the last of the four investments we've made in our most recent fund, which was September last year, we're the only Australian VC and there's a lot of US VCs coming in here and this idea that the world's becoming flat. You know, I mean, these conversations, yeah. are, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting, um, you know, pretty yeah. interesting time. Are you seeing that play out? I just beginning, just yes. beginning, you know, in the last couple of weeks. And, um, but I, but I have, I have every expectation that that's going to, it's going, that is going to accelerate. And, and us as just, as just speaking on behalf of one firm, we'll have to, we'll have to uh, react to that. Now we could react to it and say, sorry, we're going to go back to our old ways, but I don't, I'm not satisfied with that answer yeah. at all. I'm definitely not satisfied with it. And same way, I'm not satisfied with the, you know, um, come come to a U.S. investor when you're going to open a you know a U.S. office. I don't know what that means anymore. Yeah, yeah. You know, for a lot of businesses, you know, yeah. whether you're you know you're providing software in the cloud or this example I gave of this company that's making uh, audio content, it's doing stories, it's basically doing movies without visuals. And you know, they're a person in New York, a person in Kentucky, a person in San Francisco, a person in Portland, and they're yeah. you know what what is what is what does location mean to them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so so for you know, there's there's a, there's, a, there's a few hundred founders sitting on this call, if you know, some of them would be thinking about you know, raising money from the US investors, um, what, what, how would they approach that? How should they think about that? I, you know, I think, it, you, know, um, it, you know, again, like in using simplistic analogies, right? If you have a fat, you know, Canva, right there, right? It can be done, right? And this world is flat, you know? And so we're not, you know, for, for some period, even if it's just another week or month or three months, it's probably gonna be a little longer than that. We're not meeting in person anyway. So the only thing is, you know, the time zones have to line up. That was how long did it take us to do this? A, you know, a minute, you know? And so I think it's like, if, you, if there are investors that, um, that you think are, 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 have experience or would be interested in the subject matter or the stage of what you're doing, it's, they're all over the world. They're all, they're all great right now. They're all open, I believe. Um, and so it's just a question of kind of getting to that, however you do that. I, I, I would say we obviously we spend a lot of time with the founders we work with, but also ones we, we don't end up working with because we, we think that's a great dynamic, whatever happens. I do, I do think we, we probably have a bit to, we the Australian community have a bit to learn to understand that the, the things that a firm stands firm, I think that a partner believes in, which I think you see a, a lot more sort of focus in your world and, and, we, and we need to learn that a bit, I think ourselves. Um, to probably a note to ourselves rather than anything else. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think it's potentially very exciting. And yeah. I don't, you know, and, and I think um, at some level, you and I, or at least we, I'm not gonna speak for you, we're kind of the incumbent, you know? And so we have to adapt. I'm like, what's exciting to me is just a whole new generation of firms that maybe even aren't starting out with a geographical limitation. And so I think they have an advantage. And so we've got to up our game. That's exciting. We'll, maybe we'll do it and be successful or maybe we won't. Um, but that I think is, you know, that's great. Yeah, I agree. So. And I just want to talk, I mean, talk, we've, we've spent a lot of time when, again, when you patiently heard me sort of fire questions at you. And then I was also, I, I had a sort of moment of joy when you asked, actually asked me a question. I thought, oh, maybe we're... <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe we're all trying to figure a bit of elements of this business out. But you, you talked a lot about the power of your network and, 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 and using that network to turbocharge your founders. And um, you try different models. You know, I think you had an enterprise kind of model at one stage. Um, yeah. What, 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 what would life look like for a founder? You know, that they take a, a speed check from USV. What does it, what it actually look like from a, in a day-to-day basis? Well, um, I think that um, I am a, I am a believer that um, I'm a believer in two things about venture capital. One is um, that it's a services business. Ultimately, you know, our, our product may be capital, but we, we serve the companies um, that, uh, that we invest in um, the same way you, relationship you have with almost any other service provider, which, which probably means um, you're on call all the time because that's the nature of the relationship. And I think that's an important part of it. So I would say that's, uh, um, that's one aspect to it. The other aspect to it that I believe is that um, it's almost like, um, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe Craig, we're like, you know, orthopedists in a way, you know, like we can kind of like correct, you know, like we can't like, you know, we can't create, you know, a human body, but maybe we can kind of just like give it a, you know, get the back, you know, crooked a little straight and then and then it walks on its own by that and by that uh, that's kind of the best analogy i've come up with i'm curious what you think meaning like if we were really if we were good at at running businesses we'd run business yeah. you know yeah. but we're not so we don't and so that's probably not where the core value lies the core value lies probably in something like hey i I've, I've seen a lot of stuff this you know so just kind of like maybe think about shifting it that way and I think that's hugely important, not like in the, in the, in the nitty gritty details, but in that kind of course correction, right? So I like to like, I always like, I don't know if, I, if you do this, I challenge myself, like, how do I know if I'm being a good investor to my companies? And so my heuristic that I use is like one time a year, I give them a good idea. If I can do that and I'm present, I'm always present. Yeah. I'm always empathetic. I'm always available all the time. And one good idea a year. And I found that usually those ideas are something like, pretty significant because you've seen something that reminds you of something. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree, I agree. I think, we, you know, we, we sort of evolved our idea of empathy. Uh, and, you know, it's because as a founder myself, you know, there was a time when I, I frankly probably got too involved and thought I could do it. Now, yeah. I've, I've let that go a long, long time ago. You don't want me anywhere near the rain. So I think we now, we now talk about empathy being, you know, understanding the experience and understanding the sort of journey that founders are on and having some empathize with that, but also having the wisdom to get out of the way and not be too involved yes. so, uh, when, and not have strong opinions when it's probably not right. You don't have a view. So I don't know whether you could you know, open that up or whether you share that view. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's not, um, uh, there's this, um, um, uh, the, I don't know if anyone likes Bruce Springsteen. He's a big U S artist and he has this, he gave this, he did the show on Broadway uh, and it's a really right. great show on Broadway. Yeah. And he, ta- and he talks, if you haven't seen it, it's really wonderful. Right. And he right. talks, yeah. He t- and he talks a lot about um, that for him, his parents um, were kind of ghosts to him. They haunted him, you know, and he decided that he decided that in his life, he didn't want to be ghosts to people in his life. He, he, the, he, the metaphor he used was like an ancestor, you know, someone that was there, you know, that you could re- look at them to come to your own conclusions, but weren't hovering over you. And I always thought that's a really good analogy, right? If we're, if we're too in the weeds, I don't think we're doing our, we're doing our jobs at all. Um, cause we, cause we get to go home at the end of the day. We don't get to live with these companies, but how can you, you know, how can you, um, um, how can you use, um, the experiences you've seen over large, uh, large selection of companies to suggest a couple things that people then can digest and come up with their own formulations. And I'll give you, I'll give you a very concrete example. Cause this is like my thing this summer, I get stuck on ideas. And one of the, uh, and one of the things I kept seeing, um, companies of are, are, the companies I was involved in do is they always, you know, they have, there's a key hire they need to make, you know, there's like a chief revenue officer or 
a VP of engineering or a head of marketing, um, and your and your your common instinct is let me go outside of my company and find the best person in the world, and I'm going to convince them to come into my company. It's they hire an executive firm or they spend a ton of time recruiting, and and they go through all that. And oftentimes that works with success. But what I found is what what they were what they were almost blind to was who are the people inside your organization already that you trust and trust you and know what the company does and are completely inculcated in the culture, but may not have the best exact experience, but what they have is trust and desire and what they're missing, the piece they're missing is the confidence you can give them by anointing them Mm -hmm. and giving them that position. And in my experience, way more often than not, those people vastly outperform, Mm -hmm. not always, this has error in it, but when it works, it works spectacularly. And I think, and so this is like, so this is just an idea, right? And I just talk to every one of my companies about it every time I can, because I just was noticing and I'm like, who inside your organization would you not hire from the outside to run that division? You know? Yeah. But yeah. is already in there and is an ex- excellent performer and mm. is just missing your, your yeah. telling them that they can do it, right? Yeah. And I think that's a unique perspective that we have. It's a them in yeah. You wouldn't get yeah, that. And if one, you need to have the pattern recognition and the count to get that kind of maturity. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's value add. One of the companies does it and it works. It's value add, you know, or one, you know, or two do it and it works and one that doesn't work because it doesn't always work. <laughs> yeah, right. Stuff like that. Interesting. Um, I, I guess um, we got five minutes ago. I didn't wanted to, there's a few questions learning here, but I think I'll come back to some of them. Uh, you, um, you wrote a piece, I guess, um, which I'm going to try and borrow from. That's okay, Andy. Um, about the, everything I know about, you need to know about venture capital. I learned through lyrics. So I, 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 totally. I'm so worried about this because I love the idea. And I want to try and do some version of this. But you know, I think you talked about long-term relationships, big, big game-changing ideas, the power. You know, um, maybe sort of I guess for the audience, sort of surface a few kind of ideas you mentioned, Bruce Springsteen before. But so, uh, your lyrics and sort of insights you got for VC and I guess for founders, how that impacts their world. Um, so, uh, I got a lot of lyrics, you know, how much, <laughs> how much time do you want to talk about? I, you know, I like, I like metaphors that guide me, you know, and I like metaphors. I like metaphors from art, you know, and a couple, um, there, there are, uh, and so I did a whole, like, I, my team forced me to do a presentation and I gave them a presentation where actually I played the lyrics about this and I think it went over well because they asked me to publish it. I think there, there are two lyrics, um, that were key lessons to me that I, I've seen more often than I work. One is, um, uh, one is a Bob Dylan lyric that goes something like, um, uh, yesterday is just a memory, tomorrow, tomorrow's never what it's supposed to be, you know, which is like, like very early on my partner, Fred, you know, Fred said to me that, you know, you're, all, you're only as, you know, you're kind of only as good as the last thing you've done, you know, and that's what is exciting about in, investing, but also the entrepreneurial journey, you kind of, kind of, you got, you got to keep, you know, keep establishing yourself, you know, and you can't rely on something that's happened um, in the past, you know, um, and you've got to kind of keep pushing forward. So I kind of always like that one. And then, and then there's this other one uh, from Lil Wayne, which is um, uh, real G's move in silence like lasagna, uh, which is great, which is just action speak louder than words, you know, and again, you know, the best, the best examples I've seen is people that, that lead with actions, not with not with words, um, and uh, and the best leaders I've seen lead that way, um, and the ones I learned from at least. So um, I used, my co-founder at Bainworks used to have uh, uh, he he was very um, he was a product person. He was very action oriented, and so and so he'd always say things like, you know, it's okay to make mistakes. It's not okay to make the same mistake twice. Mm-hmm. And so it was always like just kind of keep doing stuff, you know, and you learn from it. Don't worry about. Don't worry about screwing up. Just don't screw up, you know, the second time. And so, just lead by action, you know, mm. not by not by language. Mm. It's a wonderful way to think about it. And I, I'm like, as I said, I'm going to try and do a version of that when I get some time. Yeah, it's really fun. Yeah, I found it really helpful. Also, yeah. uh, um, and I, just, I can see I can see um, some some, uh, some some things in the chat here. So uh, a, a Drake a Drake lyric. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, there were a couple of Drake lyrics there, yeah, yeah. or at least one, I think. I don't even remember. Yeah. Uh, look, Andy, we're, we're coming up to the end of the, the call. It's, it's the evening, your time in New York. So I guess I want to make sure I can wrap up sort of respectfully and not 
use people's time. Um, I, I just wanted to reiterate the, um, the, the appreciation we have for you taking the time out to share your thoughts. It's been a wonderful conversation. I think what I've heard here is there's a real sort of nod to the global connectivity. Um, maybe there's a day when your Berlin to LA horizons expands. Who knows what that new norm is? But I think it's um, where, wherever that lands, I think it's it's pretty great news that for Australian founders that people like you are prepared to think about a world outside of that. And I think um, uh, it's also good that you can see there's a playbook here that's that's been established by. You talked about Canva. There are many other businesses, by the way. But I, 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 yeah. So, but like we're simple, we're simple. US VCs are very simple. I'm not suggesting Canva is the only su yeah, yeah, successful yeah. company, far from it. But like we get that. That's all you need to say. Yeah. The analogy works. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, um, they're very, they're, we're, we're very simplistic in the, in, 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 in the way we try and organize a lot of information to make macro level decisions. And to me, like the reason I mentioned that one is that that's one like, wow, you can build a world transfer transformational yeah. company everywhere, including this place that maybe we ignored. Yeah, yeah. For too long. yeah. No, great. I think that's come through in your in your thematics, your publishing, and the conversations I've had with you. Um, so I think I think it's inspiring for all of us that you're kind of interested in you know do you only a zoom away? And I'd love for a day when we can and maybe get you on a plane, maybe not, but um, maybe, but certainly do some more co investments with you. Um, yeah. So I really appreciate uh, you, you you taking the time, Andy. And the funny thing is, Greg, we we have you and I have experience because we co invested, you know, a New York firm and a you know, U.S. firm and a Australian venture firm co invest in a company based in Estonia. <laughs> and so there, there, there are analogies. Yeah, yeah. You know? So, um, so that works. Yeah. Okay. So more of that. Well, again, I'm really thrilled, Andy. Thank you. Appreciate you taking the time. And I guess for the rest of the committee on the on the call, this is our first of our new um, a new open source VC series. There's more speakers uh, looming, maybe not as luminary as Andy, but looming. Uh, and uh, stay tuned and we'd love to have you on board. Thank you.